Welcome to the SCR Connections November webinar session. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us. We are particularly excited about today's topic as it was a topic that was requested by our Outreach Advisory Committee, and so I hope it will be a great session, and I thank you all for being here today. I'm going to be passing it over now to Peg Seeger of University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio. Peg is the one who's brought in our speaker, Dr. Fernando Martinez. And so I will let uh, Peg facilitate. She'll go ahead and introduce our speaker. Good morning, Peg. Good morning, and thank you so much, and good morning to everyone who's attending. We are very excited to have so many people listening in today. Um, I'm going to introduce our, our presenter today, Dr. Fernando Martinez. As you will see from the slide, Dr. Martinez is a professor and coordinator for the Community Health Worker Program at Northwest Vista College here in San Antonio. He established the CHW program to enable students to earn Texas State certification as a community health worker and as an AAS in community health. To date, over 300 students have graduated from the program. Dr. Martinez as well has an extensive background in hospital administration, other community health worker programs, and higher education. He is a former administrator at Christus Santa Rosa Healthcare in San Antonio, where he designed and implemented a community wellness outreach program, which was the first hospital-based community outreach program in San Antonio. Before turning things over to Dr. Martinez, I'd like to set the stage a bit regarding the nature of outreach collaboration and partnering. I think, as we all know, it is vital to understand the background, types of training, and motivation of any community organization with which we partner in order to build effective and sustainable outreach programming. Dr. Martinez has the unique and extensive background to provide this insight into community health workers, but it's up to all of us to seek and establish the personal relationships that make any kind of collaboration successful. While most of Dr. Martinez's background is in the state of Texas, he will provide some basic information in other states in our region, including New Mexico, Louisiana, Arkansas, and Oklahoma, and a lot of the concepts can apply across the board. To this end, we hope you get a lot out of the presentation and that you will feel that you have what you need to start reaching out or expanding your contacts and involvement with not only community health workers, but other types of grassroots organizations in your communities as well. Please feel free, again, to enter any questions you have in the chat box. Uh, Dr. Martinez may answer some questions as he goes through his presentation, and there will also be time at the end. If we cannot get to all the questions this morning, I will be glad to follow up later. There are a few links in the presentation that we will not be able to share with you directly, but they will be put in the chat box so that you can access them in order to see what Dr. Martinez will be describing. These links uh, that you can go back to in order to refresh your memory as needed. Um, and as uh, also was indicated, the PowerPoint copy of the presentation and outline will also be provided to everyone. Dr. Martinez has graciously offered to it to anyone who would like to adapt it for their own needs. Now, without further delay, here is Dr. Martinez. Well, good morning. I, um, it's certainly my pleasure to, to talk to you folks. Uh, Peg and I and the folks here at the um, UT Health Library System have a great relationship, a great collaboration that goes on. And so when I was asked to present this, I was very, very happy to do so. So please, welcome to all of you. Um, just to give you an idea, the Northwest Sister College is part of Alamo Colleges in San Antonio. And that is our campus. That's not a made-up picture. We have a really lovely campus. Beautiful. Next to SeaWorld, so it's typically known as Shamu U. Uh, what we're looking at next would be the objectives for this discussion this morning. What, um, what I'd like to be able to do is, is to make you understand what community health workers are, uh, where you can find and connect to community health workers or people who are doing that upstream work in your community. Um, We'll also take a look at, together with Peg, how librarians and, and uh, your outreach activities can overlap and help each other. And then we'll talk about the, perhaps the, uh, not only the benefits, but the challenges of doing a community outreach program uh, in your particular location. All right. The, let me 
give you a little bit of the background because it's um, we've had a maturation of the process. We've been certifying, state certifying community health workers in Texas uh, since 2005. And before that, there was a history of community health workers or what we call in Texas promotora de salud uh, for a long, long time, many generations. And the genesis of that was the lack of resources, lack of access to health care, and the community health workers or promotores de salud were sort of uh, particularly very um, forceful in rural areas in reaching underserved populations. And they sort of developed a tradition of sort of a medical fixer, a navigator, and that has matured now into a Department of Labor job code specification for community health worker, and subsequently the growth of the uh, career field. Um, this also included a skill transition, and I hope librarians can, can appreciate this. Uh, originally, going back, let's say, a generation or so, these were just life skills on the job learning. Somebody taught you something, you observed something, and you pass that on to someone else. Um, and there has now been a transition to where this is a curriculum-based, evidence-based training program. And that evidence-based performance, which when we looked at by uh, organizations like the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and also the American Public Health Association, uh, clearly demonstrates that community health workers are a valuable member of a clinical team or a social team. Uh, justice team, and they provide measurable evidence-based results, which is important because employers want to know that those salary dollars are going to come back and result in a change uh, in the direction that, they, uh, that their organization is striving for. Um, but there still is some tension, and I'll, I'll be honest with you, there's still some tension between the, let's say, sort of a historical um, community health worker who is working from the goodness of the heart and the compassion to the community health worker who is school trained and following a curriculum. And sometimes there's a tension between the two, a little bit like old school, new school. Um, but we, you know, we anticipated that as we began to professionalize uh, the program in order to provide the best foundation and problem solving capability for the community health workers. This is what we do in Texas. Now, we don't often run around and brag what we do in Texas, okay? But <laughs> we'll brag a little bit here, okay? Um, the state set up the certification program and looked at eight domains, and um, we'll go over the domains in a little bit le uh, later, things like communication and skills and knowledge and uh, advocacy. Uh, but you need to provide 20 hours of training in those eight core areas. Um, in our school with the state, it is a certificate, a level one certificate through the um, Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. It's also either a 17 credit hour program, six courses, or we also offer it as a continuing education program. It's the mirror image of the, of the academic course. And this allows us to have students come in and get state certified who do not have their high school diploma or GED. Because we have a number of non-traditional students who did not get their high school diploma or GED that are excellent community health workers. And so we remove that barrier of getting college trained by allowing them to enter into the continuing education program. We have an Associate of Applied Science in Community Health and uh, we have coordinated with uh, UT San Antonio and also Texas A&M San Antonio so that the students can take their applied associate degree and, and work towards a bachelor of applied associate degree in sociology or community health. Our program also has an internship, which is uh, 160 clock hours. And this is to provide the student the practical day-to-day -day experience as a community health worker and also help them develop a professional network of contacts uh, that are important when you look uh, for jobs. Because we are a workforce training program, Texas requires us to track graduation rates, employment rates, 
and starting salary rates. So all of those numbers are tracked. We are, we're at about right at 90% employment rate and the latest Texas Workforce Development Study that was uh, fall of this year uh, put the starting wage for a certificate one student with no experience in Texas in our region at about 17, just under $18 an hour. Now, what we have there are some links, and, and I'll talk a little bit about these links. Um, the first one is the Texas Department uh, website for the Community Health Worker Program. And again, since we've been doing this since 2005, this website is rather robust. Uh, it has a lot of links to other organizations that are doing training. It offers uh, links to the continuing education requirements that the students are required to keep up. And also it has a public forum for both state issues and regional issues. So this is a very, very important uh, website for us in Texas. Additionally, we have the, um, uh, the website that it covers for the uh, National Association. Well, good. Uh, let me see which one we're looking at. There we go. The one, that, uh, the one that I think is particularly important that will help you folks if you're looking for what's available in your area is the one that's from the, um, the American um, Society of, what is it, um, Territorial Health Organizations, State and Territorial Health Organizations. You may be more familiar with that. It's uh, Association of State and Territorial Health Organizations. If there is a state that you are interested in or your own state and you want to know what the current certification or licensing is or training programs are for community health workers, this particular document, which is listed at the end of your handout uh, on a link, is uh, very, very helpful. It'll, it'll help you, it'll guide you to that. Okay. When we were, and we get a lot of, I get calls um, from various states and various programs. Uh, there appears to be a lot of interest now in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, and um, people are asking, how do we start a program? What do we do for a program? And there are often organizations within a city, a region, and a state that are doing community health worker activities, but you may not recognize them as being community health workers. Um, one of the expressions that's being used more commonly today are, is something called an upstreamer. Um, this is, um, and if you're familiar with public health models, um, this is sort of a, an analogy or a parable that they use about public health, where we have our rescuers of people who are floating down the river to the waterfall, and those are your trauma surgeons and your specialists who are plucking people before they go over the edge to the waterfall. And your primary care providers are further upstream building a raft so that people don't get to the waterfall. And then the upstreamers, including community health workers, are the folks who are trying to find out how are the people being tossed in the water? What is the sort of the root cause of that? And the upstreamers, community health workers, they're the ones that are responsible for developing processes and developing networks of collaboration to reduce the impact of whatever the problems are that are endangering people and putting them at higher risk for disease and social problems. When we looked, um, looking around, I said that in Arkansas, you do have a statewide community health worker summit. Um, and so if you were looking to try to connect with state or excuse me, community health workers in your state, um, you can look at that uh, curriculum and the people who sponsored it, and that would probably be an easy way to connect to them. Um, within Louisiana, there is an outreach network, again, that should enable you to look at regional areas or areas of the state. New Mexico has a formalized program. They do have a, um, under their Department of Health, they do have an Office of Community Health, uh, which would be very beneficial. In Oklahoma, outside of perhaps the, um, um, 
Native American um, health associations, I, I didn't see um, any evidence of a community health worker uh, training program. Uh, but again, I'm sure there's organizations that do that upstream work uh, who, who may not be made, uh, who may not be called community health workers. Going back to our training, the initial certification is two years, and there's no fee for certification. Um, once a student is certified by the school, uh, and the instructor has passing the courses, they can apply for certification. In the two-year period, they have to um, accumulate 20 hours of continuing education. Uh, and we have a network of folks that provide those CEUs. Uh, the college and myself, we provide them also. Um, and as a matter of fact, uh, it's an opportunity for the um, librarians in your region to host these CEU events in, in case that the community health workers do need to get CEUs to continue their certification. The focus of the training, and we'll, get, we'll talk more about what community health workers do, but the focus of our training is to enable individuals to influence the behavior of other individuals and families towards wellness. And, and when we speak of wellness, we, we don't speak of just physical wellness. We look at the primarily the social dimensions of health. And uh, you know we're convinced, um, as other people have said, that you know your zip code is more important than your genetic code. And that fabric of your life, your work life, and your family life has a much bigger impact on your overall health than uh, perhaps your genetic quality. Then and again, we don't get any movement towards change unless we change behavior. And that's why we focus so much on showing the students how to develop a relationship and then using that relationship that's a mutual trustworthy relationship to begin to influence change in the individuals and families that they're responsible for. We have, um, we have since 2010 the Department of Labor job code for community health worker. But we also have all kinds of different positions that community health workers fill. Um, we look and we, and we tell our students to look at what the principal responsibilities and core uh, uh, job requirements are, functions are and then marry their capabilities to that rather than to the job title. So over the past number of 12 years or so, these are the types of jobs that our individuals, community health workers hold. Some of them have traditional titles, others have more. Um, we have more and more of our community health workers moving into private insurance plans uh, to be put in charge of a cohort of chronically ill patients, and of course, the insurance company's motivation is to prevent the loss of funds in caring for sick patients. And the community health worker's job is to get people to change their behavior in order to maintain their health. And uh, so we have a lot of folks moving into that area. Okay. Here we're gonna talk about how do you connect with folks, okay? If, there's, if you're training community health workers in your state or region, um, that's a pretty direct link. You can go to that training organization. Um, I know when I was looking at the website in New Mexico, they list the training organizations in the state for community health workers, and you should be able to make some um, direct contact with them. Nearly every region and large city in any state as some type of health collaborative or some initiative in which they're looking at, okay, what are the primary causes of concern as far as health or maybe even social justice within our community? And these, there are already people who are organizing to do this. Um, again, going sort of under this upstream model of care. And so if you, for example,
example, if you just if you didn't know where to start, uh, you might start first with the United Way. If you have a uh, your local United Way office would probably have all types of activities in which they're involved in, either as assessments or or helping out. Um, if you have a um, metropolitan health district or public health district, um, we're very good partners with Metro Health in San Antonio. We um, we uh, have a long-term relationship with them. Uh, they are using community health workers in Metro Health in a program called our Neighborhood Engagement Program. And what this is, is a, you know, just if I take to take a moment, for years and years and years, we've looked at uh, stressed communities um, and conducted what we call needs assessments. We would go out and say, essentially, what do you need? What are your problems? How big are they? What's the magnitude? And we've done that for a long, long time. And, and unfortunately, sometimes we still do that. Um, but in San Antonio, in the 10 zip codes that are particularly stressed, we are doing asset-based community development, ABCD. And that's where you go out and you survey the strengths and assets of a community, and then you build programs based on those strengths. And it makes sense because if you go to a community and say, what do you need? And they say, I don't have this, I don't have this, um, then, it's, then they feel like clients, they're waiting for someone else to solve their problems, and they don't recognize the strengths that they have within their community. And every community, no matter how stressed out and low resource, no matter how partially impacted it is, it has strengths. And if you survey those strengths and then build programs on those strengths, you can get real commitment towards change. Um, the only downside of this is that, you know, it works very well, but it takes time. And sometimes our political cycle doesn't allow us a lot of time to show change. It's easier to go in and build a clinic, paint rocks a different color, and then point them and say, look what I did. But the long-term behavior and, and the metrics that we have for measuring outcomes don't change. And that's why we, that's why we try to use asset-based community development. At this point, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Peg talk about how we work together and uh, give you some ideas of how you can work with community health work. So before I go on with a little bit more about what's on the slide here, I wanted to go back to something Dr. Martinez has, had alluded to that uh, within his program, they offer internships. And there are a number of community organizations that community health worker interns can serve with. We had had the experience, this is a project that actually started quite a long time ago, but we partnered with one of the clinics here in San Antonio, the University Health System CareLink Clinic. And we worked with CareLink on developing a program whereby any of their clients who were newly diagnosed uh, with a disease, such as diabetes, for example, would have an opportunity to use the resources in Medline Plus. Uh, we set up computer kiosks um, and at at the point of diagnosis, the uh, patient or client would be given the opportunity to learn more um, about what they had been diagnosed with. We know this is a key point, unfortunately, in chronic diseases, that people need to understand specifically what's happening and, and how to maintain their health. So with this program, one of the key elements is that there's a community health worker intern from Northwest Vista who is the person who sits down with the individual uh, to start showing them resources from the National Library of Medicine, of course. But the important part is that relationship that's established at that point with the patient. Um, just getting the patient at that point, showing them reliable resources, and also being able to show how they can look up information on their own, deal with some of the questions that they have. It was a very successful program um, it's still ongoing, it's certainly the interns are still there uh, at CareLink and they're certainly still utilizing uh, National Library of Medicine and Medline Plus resources. Um, but that's the case where, again, we got funding uh, to 
uh, set up the, the computer kiosks and also do some help with training uh, the community health workers on NLM resources. And it was a very successful and well-documented program. Um, along with that, I wanted to give you some other ideas. Dr. Martinez has already talked about this a little bit, um, but one of the things you can do is provide training on resources from the National Library of Medicine. This can support not only community health worker CEU certification requirements, but also just general professional development. And in general, it's also a key way to support community health literacy and that you are filling a train the trainer role and working with those who can often do the most good with the training they have to pass it on to those who need it the most. Um, Dr. Martinez also mentioned that we partnered this summer on a continuing education day. Um, it was organized by Dr. Martinez. So this is one of the great things, of course, in our, our collaboration with Northwest Vista and with Dr. Martinez is that um, he's already developed this program to such a degree that it's uh, very helpful for us to be able to partner with him and do what we do best, and then he provides basically the rest of it. Um, the continuing education days, um, it was Dr. Martinez again who had the thought, well, why don't we have them come to the library instead of the regular location? Um, the continuing education day draws from community health workers from surrounding areas, and I think we had about 50 or 60 people who attended. Um, the idea, again, was to increase awareness of and comfort with using our library for area community health workers. This is, I think, another one of the gaps that exist between what libraries and librarians can do and the reality of what the community health worker day-to-day -day life is like. We have to reach out and facilitate some of this connection um, and helping them be aware of the resources that are available to them. Um, along these lines for the day, we provided a tour of the library to encourage uh, the community health workers to utilize our resources, again, for their community health literacy projects and professional development. We also provided a presentation on NLM and library resources. We focused on the CEU topic of the day, which was chronic disease. So this is another point that is really helpful for us to partner with um, Dr. Martinez on a particular day. The topic is selected. We can then adapt that uh, using the resources that we have. In addition, we provided a bibliography which featured literature on community health workers and chronic disease projects. So I think many community health workers don't realize how they are featured in the biomedical literature. And I think it's an important thing to show them uh, that this is indeed uh, an area that is taken very seriously and it's important for our healthcare system. Um, I think it's important for health science libraries and librarians to advocate for and to reinforce the fact that the role that community health workers play in support of community health literacy and implementing more effective initiatives in treatment of chronic disease is more fully recognized. Um, I think it's a very uh, fruitful partnership for any outreach program to be able to work with community health workers. We can also assist uh, community health workers in applying findings from the literature in support of local initiatives. I know on the day that we had the community health workers here, I had a lot of questions, uh, certainly about NLM funding and projects that we could work on together. They had some very specific questions about how to go about working on something like this. And that's another sort of a gap again that you expose once you start doing this outreach, you realize some of the other things that need to take place um, in order to set up projects so that it is something that community health workers can take part in. Um, we can also facilitate opportunities for collaboration and funding not only with our libraries, but with our institutions as well. Um, our uh, campus here is fortunate to have a num number of community health workers who are already integrated into departments such as Department of uh, Family and Community Medicine. Uh, we can also facilitate relationships between community health workers and other local organizations with whom we already work. 
Um, I have a few other questions for Dr. Martinez, but for our last slide, I'm going to turn it over to him. And uh, I have a few questions that I want to follow up with him on. And please also uh, type some questions into the chat box there, and we'll be glad to answer them. I would, um, I would like to just um, say how important Medline Plus is to our community health workers. Um, that is an asset that, again, it's, um, it's tiered so that if you just need general information, it's readily available. If you need the latest research, if you need videos, if you need other connections like that, uh, and Medline Plus, again, is authoritative, it's evidence-based, and it really does help particularly our community health workers that are patient navigators within a clinical system for cervical cancer, hepatitis B, breast cancer. It really, it really helps provide them the, the knowledge that they need in order to expand the health literacy and health competency. Um, I would, uh, these are just sort of encouragements that I would have for your outreach program, okay? Um, it's, the relationships are very important, and the relationships should be mutual and trusting. And again, with those types of relationships, then you can begin to have an influence on behavior and begin to change. Um, you also have to recognize that there are stresses that are, may not be visible. Um, you know, we all have, all of us have stress in our life. Uh, unfortunately, some of our families and individuals have chronic stress or distress in their life um, almost consistently. And those can affect their health and limit their choices and sort of focus their behavior in ways that are not healthy. Uh, and we have to be able to understand that. Um, the shared objectives and goals, that's, that's sort of um, straightforward. You know, everyone says, well, we'd like to improve this, we'd like to make this better, or so forth. I would just encourage you that as you reach these goals in a collaborative fashion, that they have some measurement that you can measure, um, some metric. Uh, and, and you, you know, it can be something that's going to be counted or measured, or it can be something that is surveyed to look for a change in attitude or lack of participation, increasing participation. But it's important to have those uh, goals and objectives. And the last one, let me explain what I, what I mean by this, is that if you are venturing out in the community, um, perhaps for the first time or with limited background in working with the community, you want to look for what we call authentic voices. And these are people that live in the communities that you're concerned about, who work in the communities that you're concerned about, who have an investment in the community. Um, sometimes um, you'll find people who will claim to be representative of the community, but they will not work or live in that community, but they want to be the spokesperson. Uh, and you can get sidetracked by that and, and not realize that until uh, the real authentic voices of the community look at you and, and ask you, what are you doing? <laughs> and why are you doing that? So um, I, would, uh, I would look for those uh, individuals, again, who you can clearly see have an investment in the community that you would, uh, that you would like to connect with. Um, I did see one question up here that I'll just answer quick. I can't answer for the webinar as far as being bilingual. But in our classes, we are bilingual. Uh, sometimes um, when we go down to the valley to produce CEUs down in Harlingen or Brownsville, um, those are monolingual uh, in Spanish uh, presentations. And we, you know, that's, that's a very important part of our ability to form a relationship is to be able to talk and communicate with all people who have an interest in this field. And so um, within the college side and within our program side, um, we are bilingual. Um, now, sometimes in the classes, we don't need to be bilingual, and other times we do. 
and, and in Texas, that means it's a kind of a mixed mash of stuff, and you would probably wrinkle your forehead if you were a native speaker, but we, you know, we get the job done and everybody moves forward. Okay. Well, and I know certainly that is a challenge with working directly with the communities, but that's another reason certainly for librarian, if, librarians. If you are bilingual, it's wonderful, but we all know that it with health, sometimes even within regions, health terms and whatnot can be different, even amongst Spanish speakers. So that's another reason I think that the relationship with community health workers in your area is so important. Um, because you can reach out to people who will be able to fill that function. Um, again, if you're in the train the trainer role, you're exposing them to resources. We know, again, something like Medline Plus has a lot of resources, not only in Spanish, but in many other languages. And while these materials may not always be um, totally adaptable to each location, I think it is something certainly that can be utilized and it's something to make other people aware of. Um, the, one of the other things I wanted to stress, some of the other resources that I think are particularly helpful uh, for community health workers, the public health partners or PH partners. Um, some of the uh, people that I talked to at the Continuing Education Day were interested. They were getting involved in writing grants and learning how to look up information. Uh, for things like People 2020 uh, resources. So um, PH Partners has some of these set up uh, PubMed searches that can be very helpful. I think those are some of the additional layers that you discover when you start working with people. You don't know it initially what they'll need, but the important thing is to understand what they're doing uh, and then try to find the resources and help them become proficient with them. Sometimes it's surprising where that leads you, um, but I see our role is primarily as a facilitator in something like that. One of the, Dr. Martinez and I, uh, before this started, we had a conversation that I wanted to get back to a little bit um, for the differences in terms as far as community health workers, promotoras, and other terms that people in these roles can be called and just for us to be aware of those and why they've come about. So I'm going to throw that back over to you and if you'd give us a little more insight. What, what Peg is talking about is that we've, we, it's easy to become a victim of your own success. Um, when we were starting out initially, the programs were all defined as the promotor or promotora de salud. And the state adopted that as the certification title. Uh, that would have been in probably 2005. Now, subsequent to that, the Department of Labor job code is community health worker. And so employers and HR departments look at community health workers. Within the communities, there is still the, a more frequent term, the promotora de salud. And so there's a bit of a, it, uh, there's a, bit of a tension um, in that employers sometimes get confused. The community health workers and the promotoras aren't necessarily confused, but they're also looking at employment. And that's, that's been one sort of shift in in the basic idea of the promotor de salud. Originally, the promotor de salud was someone who did this for free, was a volunteer out of the goodness and compassion of their heart. Uh, but that doesn't put food on the table or pay the rent. And so this professionalization has come back to where we're sort of saying, okay, they are community health workers and promotor de salud. Uh, now, this may not make any difference wherever you are in uh, Oklahoma or Louisiana. Uh, maybe it does in New Mexico and, and, and in Texas. But it's just a, it's a blending of the two cultures and a movement towards a professionalization of skills that used to be learned and volunteered by. 
that's sort of the, the tension that's developed over time. So, um, if for example, I have community health workers that are again working for the insurance companies and, and keeping cohorts of people sick uh, from causing medical expenses, and they're making close to $30 an hour, but they're sitting in a cubicle on a phone doing that work. And then I have community health workers walking the streets and mobilizing neighborhoods, and you know they're making seventeen dollars an hour. And so, you know, it's 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 evolving, I guess. You know, we don't want to lose contact with our roots because that's the part that provides the compassion, the understanding, the ability to form the relationship. But we also know that employers are pushing certain parts of us in a different direction. And I know that when I first moved to this part of the country, um, and there was already a long tradition in this library of working with community health workers in Promotoros, particularly in the Valley, it was very confusing to me. I, I was trying to figure out exactly what the difference was between uh, the individual groups and what it meant for partnering with them. Um, and thanks again to a relationship with Dr. Martinez, that's the other thing I would uh, suggest is to find an advocate in your area um, who works with either community health workers or promotors or other people in those roles who can give you the background in your own area because it is a very local thing in a lot of ways. Um, it looks like we do have another question here as far as articles um, about healthcare providers, community health workers, uh, contributions for patient, patient care. And yes, there is that. There are those articles out there in the literature. And I think Dr. Martinez had mentioned this before, that um, of the reports that come out, studies have been done based on various types of criteria um, for community health workers. And they have done studies as far as um, you know, what types of involvements of community health workers have been found to be the most beneficial and that are the most measurable at this point. And I'd say all of this is certainly ongoing. Um, I would mention that when we did our CEU training here, and Peggy mentioned it earlier, she provided a bibliography of community health worker evidence-based projects and programs and results of those. So, um, you know, the, that's, a, that's an easy list to come up with. Yeah. And you, and you can start with, again, what the Centers for Disease Control said and what the American Public Health Association said. And quite honestly, if we have a moment, the experience of, that we can talk about is with the um, university hospital system and its community health workers that it uses in its uh, family practice clinic. They have a cohort of uncontrolled diabetics because A1Cs are eight or nine. And they hired community health workers two years ago as part of the clinical team. And the measurement was going to be the reduction in A1C numbers. That was going to be the metric. And they had not seen any of these A1Cs go down for a number of years, which is why they brought in the community health workers. And once they started the home visits, the shopping experiences with the patients, the breakdown of isolation, because a lot of these patients were isolated and subsequently their health was suffering, um, developed that relationship, they were able to measure statistically across the board improvements in the A1C. And the patients were much more accepting of the community health workers' advice and support as far as the relationship than the eight minute doctor visit. So that's, you know, it, it does work. And that, that again is a really good example and those are the types of things that yes, you can find literature on. I think the end of that question was something about acceptance and I wasn't sure if you meant acceptance by healthcare professionals or, um, and I think again, that is something that is evolving. Uh, certainly when, when a clinic sees that type of thing going on. The acceptance by the clinicians is, is strong because most clinicians do not feel comfortable talking about upstream issues, where you work, where you live, how do you buy your food, so forth. Um, 
and they think they're grateful that someone can address these upstream issues and see an improvement in the patient's health. So yeah, the acceptance are, it's, it's high. Because quite frankly, that's something again that the clinicians are not experienced in and don't have the time for, and that's specifically what community health workers can and do do. Um, we also have a question here about uh, professional development events or conferences. Um, and I know Dr. Martinez has been responsible for a number of conferences for community health workers in our area. The state organization has state conferences, regional conferences. We have an annual conference in San Antonio. We have the CPU events. Uh, the community health workers show up at the drop of a hat for, uh, you know, for anything. All I have to do is provide catering and we'll have a huge crowd. Uh, and so there's plenty of opportunity for the important networking that occurs. Um, the conversations over lunch and in between the training sessions of what works, and I have this problem, and does anyone know how to address this? And it's sort of that cross-fertilization that occurs that really makes these conferences and these professional seminars very worthwhile for the uh, participants. So along with that, there was, I think, another part of the question as far as certification for community health workers. Uh, do we need to have years of experience before starting, or can I study now? Uh, looks like she just started working. Well, in, I'll address it for Texas because if your state doesn't have certification or they're, you know, with that, then that's going to be a different path. Um, but we have open enrollment and we want people to, the reason I want the, or really like the training program is that it provides a very strong foundation in order for the community health workers to solve problems. Um, that's almost what all employers want. They want you to be able to, well, they want you to show up, they want you to be reliable, uh, but they want you to solve problems, communicate, and work as a team. And, you know, and we have to provide them a strong foundation in which they can solve problems within their scope. And so, uh, to sort of, you know, do you have you have years experience before you begin? Um, it is variable. You know, I have students who just came out of high school whose life experiences are, are fairly limited. And then I have folks that are even older than I am in class, grandmas and great grandmas, um, who maybe have been working for years and years in a different field, but now want to be involved in community health and they bring such a wealth of life experiences. Uh, but it's sort of that blending of youthful enthusiasm and wisdom that, uh, again, we see crossing in the classroom, uh, and it's, it's, it's amazing. Um, we also offer online classes, okay? And I know this is a sort of an online feature that we're doing right here, but I much prefer the face-to-face -face because we're able to develop stronger relationships. But we have access online uh, throughout the state of Texas. You can be trained to be a community health worker and never leave your living room. Um, I see that we have one, well, we have a couple of questions here. I know we have some housekeeping to take care of. Let me see if I can address a couple of these real quickly. Again, if we don't get to all of them, I will be glad and in, with Dr. Martinez to follow up on them. Um, so let's see. Let me, let me address why you're looking there. Someone was asking how do you start a program in your state? Um, I have exported our curriculum to whoever wants it. Wow. Okay. Um, you know, the, the whole schmear. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the whole schmear means to you, I can, I can provide you that. And we've sent that to various states and they've used it to tailor to their own training programs. So um, if you don't mind getting something on a flash drive, then, uh, then that's fine. Uh, one of the other questions was if the CEU days are full day events. I think usually the ones that you do are pretty much a full day, but they don't have to be. Well, we offer five hour sessions and we include a one hour lunch and we try to end by three so I can take my nap. <laughs> That's the important. That's the only. That's the only limiting factor. Okay. 
Yeah, and as long as there's there's good food and and a nap, and a nap that's that's okay. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to end it there. I don't want to run us too long for the end of the housekeeping that needs to go on, but I want to encourage all of you, please, to get in touch with Dr. Martinez or myself. Again, Dr. Martinez is such a wealth of information, so if you're interested in finding out more about how to get something started in your area or make particular contacts, if there's anything I can provide on uh, what we've done as a library. Uh, we're glad to follow up on any of the questions that you have. So at All this right. point, I will turn it back over. Thank you so much, Peg. Well, this has been a really fabulous session, such great information, and I know there's lots of questions that people put in the chat box, and, and please feel free to contact them, either Peg or Dr. Martinez. They have their email information here on the screen, and you can certainly email our office as well, and we can put you in contact them if you would like your questions answered. Um, so I do ask that everyone hang on for just a few more minutes. We do have some final housekeeping to take care of, but let's give a, a final huge thank you to both Peg and Dr. Martinez. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to have you both with, with us today, so thank you again. All right, I'm going to go ahead now and end the recording, and we'll do our final housekeeping items. <laughs>